Matthew 12 and Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to, um, to try to be extremely uh, uh, brief this morning and just directly to the point. Amen? Ephesians chapter 6. When you make it to Ephesians chapter 6, say, I made it. Starting in verse 10, the scripture says this, Finally, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we, uh, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now listen to this, church. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you once again for another day you've given us. Father, we want to thank you once again uh, for the time that you've allowed us here uh, this morning to come together, uh, to worship you, to praise your holy name. Father, we want to thank you for each and everything you've given us. Father, we want to thank you for your word. And today our prayer is that you would speak to us through your word. Father, today we pray that we would be changed by your word, that we might be conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that today, through the power of the Spirit and through the power of the Word of God, Father, that one individual may be saved. Father, we love you. We thank you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And amen. Guys, we're going to be uh, continuing our series this morning entitled Just Pray. Uh, last week, if you were here, you saw that we moved uh, from how to pray to what to pray for by touching on the subject of intercessory prayer. Last week, we defined intercessory prayer as pleading to God on behalf of another individual. We saw in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that it was good and acceptable in the sight of God for, interpress, uh, for intercessory prayer to be made for all men because God's desire is for all of mankind to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. This is God's purpose. His purpose is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we saw last week that through intercessory prayer that the focus was actually on the lost. The focus was on the unsaved. Therefore, God's purpose needs to become our prayer. Just as Jesus Christ intercedes on behalf of you and I, you and I need to intercede on behalf of other individuals. We need to understand this morning that salvation oftentimes begins with the prayers of the saints, which is one of the many reasons that prayer is our greatest ministry. Prayer is our most effective tool that, that we possess. You need to understand this morning that when we pray, there is a battle that begins to rage. I want you to be aware that when we are interceding on behalf of other individuals, that Satan is not going to sit idle. He's not going to sit idle while you pray. He's not going to sit idle while we preach and teach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is not going to sit idle while we win souls for Jesus Christ. There is going to be a battle. There's going to be a war. And he hates prayer and he hates any ministry that is backed up by prayer. Why is that? Why does Satan hate it? Because Satan understands that our most powerful and effective weapon in the midst of spiritual warfare is without a doubt prayer. Amen? We need to understand this. We need to understand our enemy. Guys, if we are ever going to be successful in the battle, we have got to understand who we are fighting against. I want you to look there in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, just briefly. The scripture says this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul says that our battle is not against 
flesh and blood. It is not against people with earthly bodies. Make no mistake, they have bodies, but they are not earthly bodies. The battle is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against evil spirits in high places. Folks, we are in the midst. Make no mistake, we are in the midst of a spiritual war against Satan and his army, and that war is being fought over the lives of men, women, boys, and girls. It's being fought over souls, and folks, their eternity is at stake. This is serious stuff. We are in the midst of a battle. And listen, our purpose, and I'm not going to make any bones about this, our purpose at Bloomingdale is to see people saved. Our purpose at Bloomingdale is that we want to see lives changed by the power of the gospel. That was the purpose of Jesus Christ, and that also must be our purpose. Jesus said, hey, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those which were lost. The Bible says that God sent not His Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Paul said this, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners to whom I am the chief. Jesus' purpose was clear. He came to seek and to save. Our purpose is His purpose. Amen? We need to be aware that when we make His purpose our prayer, that there's going to be a fight that's going to be waiting on us. We need to understand this this morning that there are two primary kingdoms upon this earth. There's the kingdom of God. That's different than the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to have time to get into that this morning. But on this earth, actively, is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. I want you to flip to Matthew chapter 12. I want you to understand that the day that you got saved, you were enlisted into the kingdom of God. Amen? We can see proof of these kingdoms in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, look there starting in verse uh, 24. Jesus had just cast out a demon uh, from a man that the Bible says was blind and dumb. He says in verse 24, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doeth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. The name Beelzebub is simply another word for Satan. What these Pharisees were essentially saying was that Jesus Christ was working directly for Satan. Jesus repi uh, replied there in verse 25, and he says this, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom Stand. Jesus said, listen, if I'm working for Satan, then how in the world could Satan cast out Satan? If he were to do that, then his kingdom would not stand. Then his kingdom would be divided. So what Jesus says right here is that Satan, number one, has a kingdom, and that it is active upon this earth, and it is not divided. Jesus goes on to say, and if I be Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God. Do you see that? Then the kingdom of God. There's the other kingdom is come upon you. So we have two invisible kingdoms that Jesus Christ mentions in this passage. We have the kingdom of Satan and we have the kingdom of God. And it is the primary task of the kingdom of Satan to keep individuals out of the kingdom of God. And the primary way that Satan does this is by setting up strongholds. He sets up barriers in the minds of unbelievers. Now I want you to understand this. When we are praying for the lost, that Satan is or has set up strongholds. I want you to flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. I want you to look at verse 4. When you're there, say I'm there. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who is the God of this age? Who is the God of this world? It is none other than 
Satan. What has he done? He has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They are living in the kingdom of darkness. They don't see their need in Jesus Christ. They are blind. Satan has set up strongholds in the minds of these individuals, and they're not going to believe unless the glorious gospel of Christ should shine upon them, is what the Scripture says. Flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to look there starting in verse 3. Paul says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There it is. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of of Christ. You see, set, uh, Satan has set up barriers. He has set up strongholds to keep people, the, the folks that we've been praying for, to keep them out of the kingdom of God. Where are these strongholds located? Well, look there at verse 5. Casting down imaginations. Where do imaginations come from? They come from the mind. He says in verse 5, Every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Where does knowledge come from? It comes from the mind. He says, bringing into captivity every thought. Where do our thoughts come from? They come from our minds. Satan has set up strongholds in the minds of those that do not believe. And if we are ever going to tear down those strongholds, folks, in the mind of an unbeliever, it has got to start in prayer. And it's only going to happen through intercessory prayer. Uh, Paul over in Ephesians chapter 6 and ver uh, verse 13, you can flip back there. He says this, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Folks, that tells us that there is an evil day that is coming to each and every single one of us. It's coming. And then he lists the six main pieces of armor in the soldier of Jesus Christ. Look what he says. The belt of truth, the, breast, the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod in the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation which protects your mind, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, our weapon of attack. But look at the seventh weapon. This is the, the main weapon that brings absolutely every bit of this together. And this is the weapon of prayer. And look how Paul wraps this up in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Folks, this does not mean that we begin to cry out to God just when the battle starts to rage. He says, always or all, four times in verse 18. Jesus said, men ought always to pray and to never to faint. The Apostle Paul said that we are to pray without ceasing. Four times he says always, always, always. That is the key to spiritual warfare. Folks, we are in a battle and the devil wants to keep us from praying. Why? Why does he want to do that? Because he has no defense against prayer. And when prayer and the Word of God, when prayer and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when those things come together, folks, it is an unstoppable force, which is exactly why he says in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, he goes right from the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and he moves right into prayer because those two things go hand in hand. If you look in Matthew chapter 12, and I promise you I'm about to wrap up. If you look in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, he goes on and he says, or, how, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? and then he will spoil his house. Guys, here's what Jesus is saying. For example, if we go into a strong man's house, let's say that has slaves, individuals that are held there against their will, and your plan is to enter into that house and immediately go for, the, uh, go for those people that are being held against their will. What he is saying is, hey, you're probably going to come out of there with some bruises. You're probably going to come out of there beat up. However, if you go into the house with the plan of binding up the 
strong man first, then you're going to have access throughout that house to grab whatever you want. You're going to have access to those slaves. You're going to have access to those people that are bound down. Amen? How are we going to bind the strong man? Paul said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong of strongholds. Prayer, folks, is our most effective weapon in the fight. Therefore, we must pray. And when we pray for the lost, folks, we are tearing down strongholds that Satan has set up in the minds of the lost. We are breaking free those individuals that are handcuffed, that are chained down and bound to his kingdom. Let me ask you a question. What are these strongholds? You see, it's different for each individual. Unbelief is one of the biggest strongholds that you can have. But what about pride? You see, pride will keep, keep more people from coming to Jesus than anything else. That is a stronghold that is in the mind of the unbeliever, and Satan uses the unbeliever. What about lust? What about unforgiveness? Not willing to forgive another individual. What about religion? Mm. What about church? You see, folks, church, the, the church can become one of the biggest barriers for an individual to actually come to Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? Do you realize that whenever there's friction inside of the church, that the people outside the walls of the church, they know about it. Believe you me, they know absolutely everything that's happening, and it does no good for the body of Christ. It keeps people from coming to Jesus. And these are strongholds that Satan will set up in the mind of an unbeliever, and that person will say, I ain't going down to that place with all people fighting all the time. Right? Got awful quiet in here, didn't it? Folks, that's exactly why the Scripture says that we're to be wise and how we treat those that are without, redeeming the time. Why do we need to be wise to those that are without? It's talking about non-Christians, because they will use absolutely every excuse in the book to not come. Amen? Prayer is what tears down strongholds. Prayer is our weapon. In Acts chapter 16, actually just flip over there just real quick, over to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas had cast out a demon from a young girl who was a soothsayer. She was a fortune teller. And when her masters saw that they were not going to be able to make money off of this young girl any longer, they had Paul and Silas beaten and thrown into jail. I want you to look there at Acts 16, starting in verse 23. The Scripture says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, meaning Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, trust them or thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. You guys see that? They prayed and sang praises unto God, thanksgiving, adoration. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and one's bands, and everyone's bands were loosed. Guys, if you think that the prayers of Paul and Silas has nothing to do with that great earthquake that came in there and opened them doors, then you are absolutely off of your rocker. We have got to realize that there is power in prayer. We've got to realize the importance of prayer. In Exodus chapter 4, God commanded Moses. He said, I want you to go into Egypt. I want you to bring the people out. And he says, what if they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe me? And God said, what is that in your hand? What did Moses say? He said, it's a staff. He said, that's a staff of my hand. God said, throw it down. Moses threw that thing down, and that staff turned into a snake. And God said, hey, pick the snake up by its tail. Whenever he picked it up by its tail, that snake turned back into a staff. Moses did not realize what he had in his hand. He didn't realize the power that he had within his hand. God told Moses, the only thing you need is that one staff to rescue an entire nation. And God's Word tells us that our purpose is to see that individuals are saved, that He's using us in this process, and He's given us a couple things. And we say, hey, 
way. God, I don't, I don't know what to do. We don't have the things we need to get these people saved. We're trying this, we're trying that. And he says, hey, what is that in your hand? You say, well, I don't know. That's the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Amen. That's the Bible. And then he says, hey, what have I commanded you to do? And you say, what, well, pray? He says, that's the only thing that you need. And just like Moses had no idea what he had in his hand, he thought it was just a staff. We have no idea the power that is at our fingertips through prayer and through this word. Amen? You see, because when the Spirit of God works, you see, guys, it has nothing to do with us. It's through the power of the Spirit of God. When He begins to work through the Word and through the prayers of the saints, folks, strongholds, barriers begin to be torn down. They'll come down, just like the walls of Jericho, come tumbling down. But you've got to have faith. You've got to believe that. You, you, you've got to start praying for that. Last week I asked you, you got a burden? All right, Keith? You got a burden for somebody. If you don't have a burden, be praying that God would give you a burden. And you know what you need to do when you get that burden? You need to begin to pray. You need to begin to pray that God would begin to tear down those strongholds in the mind of that individual. And you know what you're going to see? You're going to see lost men, women, boys, and girls come to Jesus Christ. That's what you're going to see. That's how much power there is in prayer. We just have to believe it. Amen? Let me ask you one question before I close. What's your stronghold? Ask yourself that this morning. If you're here and you're not serving him, you might be here and you've never been saved. You might be here and you've fallen away. There's something, there's something, there's something in your life that's keeping you. There's a stronghold there. There's something there. You need to pinpoint it. You need to figure out what it is and say, you know what? I'm turning every bit of that over to the Lord. Whatever that is, it may be a circumstance. It may be something that happened in your life. It could be pride. It could be lust. It could be unforgiveness. It could be any of those things. It could be the church. Whatever that stronghold is, you need to take it to Him. You can take it to Him today in prayer, and I'm telling you, He's going to knock that thing down. He'll remove it from the equation, amen? He'll take it away. You've got to turn everything over to Him. Amen, church? Let's rise. Father, thank you. For the time that you've given us here today, Father, we love you so much. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Father, we want to thank you, dear Lord, that you continue to challenge us and continue to convict us on the subject of prayer. And Father, we're just, we're just scratching the surface. There's just so much. And Father, we know that the scripture tells us that with, without Jesus that, that we can't do anything. And Jesus told us that, that, we, that we would actually perform mightier works than, than he did. And Father, we know that that all comes through the power of the Spirit, the Word of God, and through prayer. And just, Father, we pray that you give us a desire to come to you, an intercessory prayer. Father, we pray that you give us a desire just to come boldly unto the throne of grace. And Father, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, Father, if there's someone here today that's fallen away, they're not serving you the way that they should, Father, I pray that you'd give them courage and strength. I pray that you would tear down strongholds. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and amen.